Uh, first and foremost, though, I want to give the viewers a chance to learn about who you are. Um, you were the first former minister of foreign affairs for then the Russian Federation and then Russia until 1996. Tell me a little bit about your role. And it's like Secretary of State. The, the role is, is Secretary of State. My counterpart was just um, Baker, Jim Baker, under the uh, Bush, uh, the father, <laughs> the senior administration. And then in Clinton administration, it was uh, Warren Christopher. So, uh, and in between, uh, there was a great guy uh, called uh, Larry uh, Eagleberg. Got it. Okay. So I, I dealt with three uh, sec uh, secretaries of state. Yes, that's true, because you were in for six years, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Okay. So we can dive right in to the issue at hand. And you know, some politicians are saying too little, too late that the U.S. didn't enact sanctions in time on Russia. Do you agree with that? I mean, how long is it going to take for the sanctions to trickle down and start affecting them to the point where they could potentially stop? Uh, I agree, uh, but not fully. You know, I, I, this crisis, what the particular crisis which you might date uh, uh, from December or probably November of the last year until today, uh, the uh, administration, I think, handled very good, uh, the Biden administration. But uh, something should have been done earlier. So my criticism is not about this period, uh, but about earlier period. Uh, and uh, I only hope that now, uh, America and the West um, in general would wake up to the Russian challenge and do things um, regularly. You know, those some of those sessions should have been put uh, in place uh, earlier, maybe a year, two years ago, because it was so evident uh, what uh, the Kremlin uh, is up to. Uh, so. Uh, but but uh, day by day, starting from December, I think they are doing a good job. Okay, but you do believe that a year ago they should have implemented sanctions? Yes, maybe not not all the sanctions, of course, which are now on the table, but some sanctions to uh, prevent uh, the, the the development of those things. You know, if you show strength earlier then they got used to that. They know that they will be met with something uh, tangible, not only words. Uh, and uh, that's the only language which uh, Moscow uh, understands now. So you said that's the only language that they understand, strength. So at this point, should the US and our European allies use any sort of military force without putting troops on the ground, like, for example, protecting Ukrainian airspace? Well, I'm not, I was foreign minister, not defense minister or uh, military. Uh, I am not, I, it's, it's very difficult to judge, but the NATO altogether, you know, and that, that's, that's very important that Biden restored uh, the NATO alliance, so to say, the, trust in, in the NATO, which was heavily damaged by the previous administration. And uh, uh, so now they um, operate within the NATO framework, more or less like leading NATO, which is important. But I don't think that many NATO countries are ready to use force directly uh, against Russians. Uh, but there are other ways that that's, uh, more weapons and I am very encouraged that Germany, which till today actually refused to send uh, weapons to Ukraine, now agreed. And uh, apparently they are sending a considerable, you know, anti-aircraft, for instance, missile. That's what they need to clear the sky, so to say, uh, over them. And uh, uh, there are many other um, weapon systems which America and NATO 
could give to Ukrainian resistance and that, that might be a game changer. You have said that Russia is still living in the Cold War era. Does it stop with Ukraine or do you think that Russia is going to try and expand further than Ukraine? Definitely. If they are not stopped uh, in Ukraine, and that's why the Ukrainian resistance, and that's why help to Ukraine by the United States and uh, other NATO countries, uh, uh, Western countries, uh, so crucial. Because if they are not stopped there, it would be just a stopover for them. Uh, they will move uh, further because uh, that's the nature of the uh, 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 authoritarian regimes. They cannot uh, provide internally for their people. They are unstable internally. Uh, they are paranoid of uh, uh, any dissent. And uh, thus, they always start uh, foreign adventures. That, that's a rule. So if, if he gets away with this, he will go on with others. So then I guess the next obvious follow-up question is, what else can the U.S. and our European allies do to stop Russia while they're still in Ukraine without, like you said, putting in military forces because some of the NATO countries aren't ready for that? Yes, not use so-called uh, boots on the ground, but as you said, uh, like provide a air defense, but you can provide air defense just giving them uh, the missiles which, uh, uh, you know, down uh, the, the planes, uh, the enemy planes. So that should have been done uh, earlier. Again, that, that's my criticism, probably a year ago, or two years ago. Uh, but it definitely should be done now. So now they must, uh, the NATO and the, uh, the United States must move very quickly because it's uh, just a matter of hours, probably not even of days, uh, the, the change of the situation and Russians are bringing new and new, more uh, destructive weapons to Ukraine. So the same should be done on the other side. It's um, military help, uh, like this heroic uh, president of Ukraine, Zelensky, Vladimir Zelensky said, uh, he is really a real hero. You know, he's sitting there in the center of Kiev, uh, uh, ignoring all the danger. And, uh, you know, for a president under this kind of siege, it would be normal by international standards to move some hidden place or even abroad. Uh, but he is really uh, sitting there in the middle of, of the, the, the fighting and uh, guiding and uh, encouraging his people to fight. So he should be given weapons and uh, the sanctions as severe as possible to uh, make it costly to uh, Russia, to, to Moscow, uh, uh, should be implied. But I think they are on the road now. They, they are on the track. Uh, in that sense, both America and many uh, NATO countries. Would Russia perceive the U.S. in giving weapons to Ukraine as intervention, and then that is a reason to escalate even further? No, uh, they, they will escalate anyway. They want to destroy, uh, capture, or whatever, uh, subjugate <clears throat> Ukraine and they will do anything. So and that, that is totally wrong logic generally that don't provoke Putin, don't provoke Moscow, don't do that, don't do that. They uh, cannot more provoked because they are aggressive and they go uh, to aggressive. They could be, can be only stopped, only uh, discouraged to do things, but to provoke them, it's it's ridiculous. They, they need no provocation. They they are provoking themselves. So it's it's wrong argument. And speaking of provoking, you were the one that offered the 1994 Budapest Memorandum with the U.S. and Clinton and U.K. wars at the time. Um, tell me about that because that is what recognized Ukraine as a sovereign nation in exchange for their nuclear weapons. 
And yet here Russia is invading their sovereignty. So how is that not a clear breach? How is the one in 2014 not a clear breach? And what are the repercussions for breaching it? It is a flagrant violation of, of Russian obligation. And you know what? Uh, the obligation of Ukraine under this memorandum, th this agreement, was that they would give their nuclear weapons, which were on their territory, and they could have uh, take possession of those weapons at that time. So uh, they lived up to their obligation. They did remove those weapons and sent them to Russia uh, very soon after the memorandum was uh, signed. So Ukraine is good on its word. And for me, it's very painful and actually shameful uh, that Moscow is not living to this obligation. And obligation was to respect uh, the territorial integrity of Ukraine in those borders which were then, you know, at that time, which included, of course, Crimea, now uh, annexed, and Eastern Ukrainian areas, which uh, they recently, Moscow recently, officially recognized as independent states. Give me a break. What kind of independent states are sitting in their pocket? You know, that it's puppet regimes. So anyway, uh, that's total flagrant violation of the memorandum. And that's why uh, the sanctions should be implemented. And that's why America and Great Britain uh, have special responsibility to live up to their obligations. It's not only moral or whatever, uh, you know, these day political uh, considerations, which are important. We discussed those. You cannot allow them to go on with aggression, but it's also obligation under the memorandum. I want to just ask one more time to make it extra clear, what else do you think the U.S. can do to stop Russia from escalating even further beyond providing weapons beyond the sanctions, because if they don't stop the invasion now, you're saying that they're going to continue expanding. So at the end of the day, do you think it's going to come down to nuclear warfare? Do you think it's going to come down to full-scale invasions from multiple countries? No, no, nuclear uh, is, they might try to blackmail with nuclear weapons, but I would completely disregard it because it's it's impossible. You know, the, the nuclear weapon cannot be used otherwise as for a suicide. And uh, if you saw, you, you can see it on my tweet, actually, a photo of Putin sitting on the long, long uh, side of a table from the visitors. And the visitors were his own ministers. And he wanted to have uh, a absurdly big distance between them because he was fearful probably of COVID. And so the person who cares so much of his health and well-being, and this, this does not look to me like suicidal because nuclear war is suicidal for both uh, America and Russia and, every, for, uh, and really for everyone. It's the end of the world. So. That, that is not in the cards. What is in the cards is to send weapons, munition, uh, maybe trainers, if, if that is very complicated uh, weaponry, and sanctions. So there, there are two powerful tools. They are now used, but probably they can be used more even and quicker, quick, quick, quick. Now it's time. Got it. Um, I, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but one of your tweets stood out to me. It's a picture of you with Lavrov, who is now in your position that you once held. You said that you trusted him to have your back then, but you wouldn't trust him to have your back now. Explain what you believe changing him from the time where you would have trusted him with a lot to now. <laughs> I don't know. It's it's really a sea change from one person to the other, and uh, explanations. You know, you, you probably need to ask a psycho 
you know, an analyst or, or somebody. I don't know. I know that these things happen uh, both ways. You know, there was once a uh, soul and then Apostle Paul, Paul, Paul who you yeah, saw to, to Paul, who uh, first was persecuting the Christians and then became one of the, the uh, most important Christians. So uh, that's good evolution, but there are <laughs> unfortunately situation uh, to the reverse, you know, to the opposite. Good people become bad people. Uh, I can tell you why, but what I see is that, and that's my tweet. And actually a lot of your questions uh, answered in uh, my book, which is called The Firebird. And The, the Firebird is a um, memoir, uh, but it also has the last part, which is uh, about the present time. So it's, uh, I, I very much recommend to everybody to read it, to better understand uh, where it comes from and how it developed, uh, but no psychoanalysis, I'm sorry, I, that, that's probably for doctors. Yeah, uh, and you mentioned current times, and I do wanna ask because some in Russia criticize you for being too westernized, for trying to build a relationship with the US and other Western democracies. Do you believe yeah. that there will ever come a day where Russia will have a strong working relationship with some of the other large democracies in this, in this world? Well, they still do. And they, even more than ever uh, right now, they, they criticize me almost daily on, on the Russian TV uh, for being so-called pro-Western and so on, which I am. Uh, I want Russia to be in, in good relations, in partnership, if not alliance, with the most developed countries of the world, like United States. Why? Not only because it's, it's natural, you know, for people to, to try to communicate with uh, most developed people, but Russia badly needs modernization, economic modernization. Russian economy is stagnated. Russia till today, like the former Soviet Union, and uh, 35 years, if not 40 years passed from the Soviet Union till today. And they still over dependent on just exporting the natural resources, oil and gas. Now they uh, try to blackmail uh, Europe with the, the gas supplies, but they have nothing um, else good. You know, like no cars, no modern, uh, um, aircraft, no nothing, but just mineral resources. What kind of economy it is? And uh, people speak that uh, Russia will be alive with, with China and that Russia has trade relations with China. Yes, they do, but it's the same story. 65% of China's export to Russia are machines, uh, are electronics, you know, are uh, uh, high-tech, so to say, maybe not, not as high-tech as American, but still high-tech products. While what Russia gives to, to, to uh, China is again, oil and gas. I, I mean, it's like underdeveloped country. So it is underdeveloped country. And that's what bothers me, but uh, you cannot be developed country if you confront uh, the <laughs> the West and they input sanctions on you, you need to cooperate with the West so that investment comes, you know, that uh, modernization comes. So anti-Russian, even if I am uh, pro-Western, they are anti-Russian there in Kremlin. They suffocate Russian economy. They isolate Russia from the world and that's not only wrong politically and morally, but it damages economy, damages the, the economic prospects of Russia. 